Thank you. I'm Jeff Hawkins. Uh, the title of my talk is The Thousand Brains Theory, A Roadmap for Creating Machine Intelligence. I work for a company, um, I run a company called Noventa. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not. So let me just tell you a, a teeny bit about it. Uh, we are a company, research company in Northern California, and we have two uh, goals. Uh, the first goal is a bio, biological or neuroscience goal. It's to reverse engineer the neocortex. So it's understand how the brain works. Uh, the second goal is to um, create machine intelligence using brain principles. Uh, my whole life, I've always felt that the, the fastest way or the surest way to uh, create truly intelligent machines was to first understand uh, what the brain does and how it works. And so I've been pursuing that uh, for quite some time. About uh, five years ago, we had a real breakthrough in our understanding about the brain. And that led to the thousand brains theory. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And uh, we started really um, how it's gonna to apply to machine intelligence. As you mentioned, um, I wrote a book about this recently called The Thousand Brains. And as you said, um, it's going to be, uh, the Chinese edition is going to be uh, published by Cheers Publishing Company uh, early next year. Everything I'm talking about uh, today is, is included in the book. The book covers a lot more, but um, so, uh, and also everything I've written about, there's a lot of materials and papers on what we've done. So there's a lot of materials. Um, unfortunately, almost all of it's in English. So. Um, but we'll have to rectify that soon. Okay, let's just get started. Um, uh, if we look at the human brain, you can uh, roughly divide it into two parts. Uh, the neocortex is about 70% of a human brain. It's a big sheet of neural tissue. It's about two and a half millimeters thick and about 1500 square centimeters or the size of a, a dinner napkin, a large dinner napkin. And it wraps around the rest of the brain. Um, the other parts of the brain are composed of dozens of specialized small areas that, that, um, that mostly are not visible. They're tucked inside and the rest of the brain wraps around it. If you think about what the, uh, the other older brain areas do, um, they control our basic functions such as breathing, digestion, reflex behaviors. Uh, behaviors such as running, walking, and chewing are controlled by the old parts of the brain. All of our emotions and our drives come from these older parts. The neocortex, on the other hand, um, is, is really the organ of intelligence. Everything we think about is perception. So if you're aware you're seeing something or feeling something or hearing something, that's going on in the neocortex. All types of language are created and understood in the neocortex. So the neurons in my neocortex right now are firing, creating my speech and having me control my computer. Um, cognition, thought, planning, engineering, math, sciences, literature, Everything we think about as the human, um, what makes us human as, as a species is really the product of the neocortex. It's all happening in, now, in those cells um, in our head. So as I said, the neocortex is, is the organ of intelligence. And if we understood how it works, uh, uh, we would know a lot about how to build intelligent machines. Uh, we, would, uh, we wouldn't be guessing, we'd know exactly what's going on. So as I said, we actually have figured out quite a bit about how this organ works in the last, uh, a dozen years or so, but especially in the last five years, we had a real breakthrough in understanding it. So I'm gonna talk about that for a bit, about uh, what we learned. The first thing you have to realize about the neocortex, it, it's, it's tempting to think of it like a computer, like it gets some input and it processes it and it does something, but that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about the neocortex is it learns a model of the world. It recreates the structure of the world, everything that you know in this model. And it's actually the model of the world that you perceive moment to moment. It's a model building uh, organ. Um, everything you know is stored in this model. How things look when you see them, their colors, their shapes, how they feel when you touch them, their textures, their shapes, and, and, their, and their temperatures, how they sound when you interact with them, those things make sound. The model includes also where things are located. It's not just a list of facts. So we know where the items in your life are, are. You know where the rooms in your house are. You know where you keep your bicycle. You know where the, the library is in your town. Uh, you know where you keep the utensils in your kitchen drawer. Um, these are all part of the model that's stored in the neocortex. And the neocortex knows how things change when we, when we interact with them. So the world isn't static. So if I were using my smartphone and I touch the, an icon, I know what's going to happen. I know what the apps are. I know what displays are gonna change. 
If I use my bicycle, I know what happens when I, when I pull the brake lever. We, each of us knows tens of thousands of things. We know about 40,000 words. We know all these concepts. It's all stored in this model in our head. Uh, it's all in these neurons. The, brains, the reason you have a model is, uh, is it allows us to recognize where we are. It allows us to recognize objects we're interacting with. But mostly it allows us to predict the consequences of our actions. We can ask questions about what would happen if I do this and what will happen if I do that. And so we're able to plan to achieve goals. We are able to think about the different actions we could take to achieve uh, a desired outcome. We do this all in the model in our head before we act. And then when we do act, we're playing out what the model tells us to do. So it's the right way to think about the new approach is to build this model of the world. And then from that, we can re-drive our intelligent behavior. Now, just let's talk about models for a second. Here's a model. This is a, a physical model that an architect might have made for a house. And um, the advantage of building a model like this, it allows you to look at it from different directions, imagine what it would look like, maybe imagine what it would look like if you changed it. It allows you to plan. You could say, well, if I was in the driveway and I wanted to get to the pool, how would I do that? How many steps would it be? What would the obstacles be? What would I have to do to overcome those obstacles? How far away are things like that? Today, we often build models in a computer. And here's a, a, a model of a house, it's in a computer. And we use them for the same reason. We can look at it from different perspectives, what would it look like from one angle, from another angle, and so on. Now, the way we build models in the computer is the following. We typically will assign some sort of reference frame. Um, uh, here I show the X, Y, Z Cartesian coordinates. And we locate the house relative to those, some origin point. And then everything in the house can be located relative to that, um, that reference frame. If I wanted to locate a door, such as this house has a garage door, we would typically create another reference frame here shown in green that locates the items on the garage door. And then we locate that reference frame relative to the first reference frame. So this is how we build models, computer-aided design models. It turns out, surprisingly, and I would have never predicted this five years ago, that the brain is doing something very similar to this when it builds models of the world. It's using a reference frame, a different type of reference frame. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, but something very similar to this. When we store knowledge about the world, we're using reference frames in the same way this kind of model is doing. So we come back to our slides here. Um, you know, the third point I want to make is that intelligence uh, not only requires learning this model of the world, but updating it continuously. Uh, it's not static. Every time we move something or, or position something differently or something changes or somebody does something, the, 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 our world changes. So we, this model is very fluid. It's constantly changing as we go about our, uh, about our lives. It's not something we learn once. It's something that's being continuously learned and updated. Uh, we never stop learning it. So now the question is, how does the cortex, the neocortex, learn a model of the world? What is the actual mechanisms that use us to do this? Um, and so that's what we spend our time thinking about. If you look at the neocortex from the outside, it looks uniform. It has these wrinkles and these, these valleys and crests, but that's just, it's just the way the tissue is folded. It, they, they don't really mean anything. But we do know that it's divided into dozens of functional regions. So there are regions for in the back of the brain for vision, there are regions on the side of the brain for hearing, and there's regions across the top for touch, somatic regions. There are regions that are dedicated to language on the side of the head. And there are dozens of other regions which are very difficult to say what they do exactly. Um, they all seem to be, every region seems to be doing something similar to other regions, but they're, they're different, but there's also, there's, there's a lot of integration between them. Now, um, from the outside, um, these, these regions look different. They look the same, excuse me. But you imagine, you would think that, well, vision seems different than hearing, which seems different than language, and which seems different than mathematics. So there must be something different on the inside that would, uh, that would they, the architecture on the inside would look different if we looked at it. So if you look at it under a microscope, and we were first able to do this about 120 years ago, um, this is what you see. Now, the surprising thing is, is that the neocortex looks similar everywhere. Even though you might expect vision areas to look different than language areas to look different than um, areas that deal with touch, they don't. They look remarkably the same. And the first person to first look at this is Romani Cajal 120 years ago. And these are pictures he took then or made then. Uh, they show a slice of the neocortex, the two and a half millimeters thickness. And immediately they started seeing that there were different cell types. They had different shapes, different sizes, and different packing densities. And so on the left picture there, you could see those. And they could say, well, these, these cells are arranged in layers. 
And then the connections between the cells uh, shown in the next picture are some of those connections. They tend to run across the layers. So most of the information goes from layer to layer across the two and a half millimeters thickness. There's some layers which send information long distances, but most of the connections are vertical. After 120 years, there have been thousands of papers published on the architecture of the neocortex. It's a very well-studied system um, and it's very complex. Uh, so people like ourselves, we make pictures like this, illustrating the different cell types, how they connect to each other, the different uh, types of connections and so on. Now, the remarkable thing, as I mentioned already, is that everywhere you look in the neocortex, in the human neocortex, and in, across in other species, like the dog or a cat or a monkey or a mouse, you see the same circuitry. They have the same types of neurons. They're organizing the same types of layers. They have the same types of connections between the layers. Every region has some sort of input. Many of the regions get input directly from the senses. Some don't. They get from other parts of the cortex. But also surprising that every region, everywhere you look, there are cells that have a motor output. So even the parts of the cortex that go, get input directly from the eyes project back and have a motor output, they control the movement of the eyes. And the parts that get the cortex that input from the ears, they control the movement of your head when you turn your head when you hear things. So everywhere in the cortex, there is sensory motor integration or sensory motor processing. It, it, there is no difference there. Every part's motor, every part's sort of sensory. But we see this common architecture everywhere. Now, this is very hard to understand. How could the same architecture uh, produce very different behaviors? So um, how is that possible? How is it possible the neocortex looks like similar everywhere? The first person to make sense of this was uh, a, a professor named Vernon Mountcastle. He was at Johns Hopkins. He's a very famous neuroscientist. And he suggested back in 1975 that the areas of the, the neocortex look the same because they perform the same basic function, the same intrinsic function. And what makes one region visual and another auditory is what it's connected to. So if you took a, a region of cortex and you hook it up to the eye, it becomes a visual region. If you hook it up to the ear, it becomes an auditory region. If you take the output of an auditory region and, and a visual region, you connect them together into another region, you might get language or something like that. He also suggested that the neocortex was composed of a replicated unit, a, a, a functional unit called, he called the cortical column. So our neocortex got large because it just made more copies of this unit. And, and so uh, uh, another mammal, animal's cortex, like a monkey or a dog or a cat or a rat, they have the same units, but just have fewer of them. Uh, the cortical column is about a millimeter in area. So that would be about 150,000 columns per human. And there's about 100,000 neurons per column. If you could look at it, it might look like this. You could see the neocortex, you can see the little columns stacked side by side. Now, if you look under a microscope, you do not see columns. They're not visible. Um, you can't tell they're there by looking at them, but we know they exist. And this little illustration shows you how. This shows the hand of a monkey, uh, or just a hand. And on the back, there's six little circles. They represent little patches of skin that are next to each other. And they're connected to uh, six zone here, six columns in the neocortex. And so if you stick a probe and you through the cortex, through these six columns, which is indicated by that diagonal line, you find that this probe would find cells that first all respond to one patch of the skin. And then abruptly, when you get to the next column, they all start responding to the next adjacent patch of the skin. And then they abruptly change again. So it's not a continuous representation. It's very, there's a patch of, a patch of sensory cortex, a patch of sensory skin that projects the one column, the next patch projects the next column and so on. And we see this basic organization throughout the neocortex. So the neocortex is organized in columns like this, but you just can't see them. Um, now there's some debate about whether uh, all the columns are actually doing the same thing uh, because you can find differences between them. Some columns, you know, have a little bit more of these cells, some have a little bit more of these cells and so on. So you could, there's a, there's a debate in the neuroscience community about this. But if you look at the, on a spectrum, you could say the columns are identical. They have the exact same architecture on one side that would be completely homo uh, homogenous or they're completely different on the other side. They're completely different looking we would find the answer somewhere around here, that 90% or so of the, arc of the actual details are exactly the same in every cortical column and a small percentage change. So even if we accept the fact that there's some differences, 90% of it's the same thing. There's some basic thing going on everywhere that's complex that explains everything that's intelligent. And so what does that do? What is that common function? That's what we want to know. So what is the cortical column doing? What is each cortical column doing no matter 
what it's connected to. Um, this led, uh, this, this solution occurred to us in a, in a thought experiment that occurred about five years ago. And I'm gonna stop my presentation, see me. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and hopefully you can see me now. And um, uh, I was in my office about five years ago and I had uh, this cup in my hand and I was touching the cup with my hand. And one of the things we know about the cortex and the brain in general is it makes predictions. It's always predicting what you're going to feel or hear or see. And so when I touch the cup, my brain is predicting what's going to feel. So you can, you can actually visualize that. You can just say, oh, my finger's on the side of the cup. I'm going to reach it up and touch the lid here. And they can imagine what it's going to feel before your finger touches the cup. I don't have to look at it. I just know what it's going to feel like before my finger touches down. So I asked the question, what does the brain need to know to make that prediction? If my finger's on the side of the cup and I'm about to move it to someplace, how does it know what to predict? And it needs to know at least two things. It needs to know what object it's touching. So it needs to know that it's touching the, uh, this cup. It needs to know this cup. And it needs to know where the finger will be when it's finished moving. It needs to know it's going to be up here because if it was someplace else, like on this handle, it would feel something different. So it needs to know where it's going to be. So where, from where it is to where it's going to be. It needs to know the location that the finger is going to be on the cup. Now that sounds very simple, but it's actually a very, very difficult thing to figure out how, to, how the brain does this because it needs to know where the finger is relative to the cup. It doesn't matter where the cup is oriented relative to me or where it's positioned to me. It's where my finger is relative to the cup. And that told us there had to be some sort of reference frame that's attached to this cup. The, the brain is making a reference frame that's attached to this cup. And so it knows where my finger is relative to the cup. Uh, that's a conclusive result. There really is no other way to get around that. So with that insight, which seems very simple, I'm not gonna go share my screen again. We'll go back to the presentation and Back to this thought experiment here. Okay, hopefully. Presentation mode, there we go. So this led to, five years later, we have what we call the thousand brains theory. And the first part about the thousand brains theory is illustrated here, that every column is able to learn complete models of the world, of, of something, or whatever it's, it's sensing. And they do so by integrating sensory input and movement over time. So imagine this is a picture of a cortical column, Here's my finger touching the coffee cup. And there's a, some, some, there's a patch of the skin at the end of my finger that's, that's getting sensory input. And that's being sent to a particular column in my cortex, this is true. And um, so we have this sort of sense feature. But we also know that the cortex is getting something else. It's getting actually indications of how the finger is moving. So it knows how the finger is moving. And from that information, it is able to keep track of where the finger is in a reference frame of the cup. So there's gonna be a, a set of cells here that actually represent a reference frame relative to the cup, and it's gonna keep track of where that finger is. And as you move your finger, it's gonna update this location and it's gonna get a new sensory input. And basically the ability to learn the structure of the cup, what the cup feels like, is this represented by the blue arrow, which is essentially learning the association between what is felt at some location and the location in the cup. It's like, what is the feature here? What is the thing that I'm sensing? And where is it relative to the, to the, the larger object? And as you move your finger around the cup, and you can do this, you can just close your eyes and touch a new object and run your finger around it, a single finger, you can build up a model of the cup. You can learn what the shape of the cup is and what it feels like in your hand. That's the basic idea of every column is doing it. The column also has a representation for what object it's touching, in this case, the coffee cup. And so now we can, those things interact. So we, we basically, the object is gonna be stable while the finger is moving. It says, oh, I know this is a coffee cup. Therefore, I know what I should sense at different locations in the cup as I move my finger. Now, it turns out that the reason we call this a thousand brains theory is that there are actually thousands of models for every single object you know. Not every cortex, cortical column is modeling everything, but every cortical column models lots of things. And if I think it's like, where is this knowledge about the coffee cup stored? It's stored in thousands of columns. Let me just illustrate it here with the three fingers. So now we're showing a picture of three fingers touching the cup. Each one is going to a different cortical column. And each one is having, it, the cortex is keeping track of the location of that finger on the cup and the input that's coming in. So we have three separate models of the cup that's going on here. Turns out you have to do this for every patch of your skin because you're, every patch of your skin that's touching the cup could do this. In a moment, I'll talk about vision as well. Now, there's another thing that we, we now know is going on is that the columns can vote. So independently, they can build these independent models. But on their own, each finger wouldn't know what it is you're touching until you moved it a few times. But they can vote. So each finger may have partial information. It might say, oh, 
I can feel this feature at some location. I can feel this feature at some location, but I don't know what the object is I'm touching. But the objects, there are layers of cells that have these horizontal connections and we believe they're voting. And so they can all say, come together and say, well, the only thing that makes sense for us right now is that we're all touching this coffee cup. And um, this of course is happening in many columns at once um, and happens very rapidly. This is why you can, you can recognize something with a single grasp if you put your fingers around it. But if you touch it with one finger, you have to move your finger a bit to recognize what it is. The same thing is happening in vision. You may not think of vision this way, but um, vision is not what most people think it is. You have an image projected on the back of your eye on the retina, but the retina is really just a bunch of uh, sensory patches. Each one is connected to a cortical column. It's very much like the skin on your, um, on your fingers or your hand, uh, except in this case, the sensory patches are moving together. But that's the way it is. Each little uh, patch of your cortex is uh, each little patch of your retina is projecting a cortical column. And what's actually going on with vision is no one's looking at the entire picture. Each cortical column is trying to figure out where its input is on the object you're, vision, you're seeing and what feature it's sensing. And they're doing the same process. They're trying to, uh, they're trying to uh, figure out what's going on out there by movement and they vote. This is why if you look at something with your, eye, with your entire eyes, you can usually recognize it with a single glance. But if you had to look through a narrow straw and you had only could see a little bit once, you'd have to move it around, just like you have to move your finger. Uh, interesting th a point of this is that parts of your, um, your cortex are stable while other parts are changing. So the object representation would be stable, even though your fingers are moving over, the, uh, over an object. So, and the same to a vision. So when I look at something, everybody, your eyes are moving about three times a second, but you don't perceive it. You're not aware of it. The world looks stable to you, but the inputs are changing rapidly three times a second. That's because you're only perceiving the stable representation layer and the other parts you're not able to perceive. The same is true with touching the coffee cup. I might, I can know by moving my hand, but my perception of the coffee cup is it's not changing. It's not moving. It's in the same place. It's the same coffee cup, even though my fingers are moving. So we only mostly aware of the, the, this voting that's going on between the columns. Now we do a lot of simulations, uh, a lot of mathematical analysis. I just thought I'd give you an example of one of the simulations before, and then I'm gonna go a couple of things here before we talk about machine intelligence and AI. So here's an illustration of, the, uh, of um, this, like showing what I was just talking about. And then I'm gonna show you how we actually model this in, in, real, in the real world. Um, so this is just a, a, a video to explain what, I'm, what we're about to see. So here you can see again, there's a finger on a single finger on the end of a finger, on the hand of a hand. It's about to touch an object. As it moves in, it knows where its location is going to be on that object. Um, it forms a representation of that, that uh, location. It then gets a sensory input and it forms a new representation in the column of that sensory input at a particular location. And at this point in time, it can't know what object it is. It might be in this case, simple example, there are only three objects, three objects it could be. It could be the cup, it could be an aluminum can, or it could be a tennis ball. It can't tell from that one touch. Um, then it moves to a new location, gets a new sensory input, and that is able to eliminate one of these things. Oh, it can't be the ball anymore because it's got a lip on it and I feel a lip, but it still could be the aluminum can or the cup. In the third movement, it is now able to get a new input, a new sensory uh, feature, and it's able to eliminate. And now in three touches, it's certain what it is. It says, aha, I know there's a cup. And you can do this mentally yourself. You can do these experiments. Here's the idea of voting. Um, you, the, ran, the hand now touches the cup at three points. So we have three fingers. Um, each one has a different location. Each one has a different feature, feature. And each column on its own is unable to determine what this object is. So the column one by one says it could be the ball or the cup. The next two columns could be the cup or the can. But when they vote, they eliminate these things that are impossible. And then instantly, you know, this is the cup. Okay, so we actually built a real system like this. Um, we started with this uh, benchmark of physical objects, the Yale Carnegie Mellon Berkeley benchmark. Uh, you, can use, you can actually get the physical objects or you can use the 3D CAD files. We use the 3D CAD files. And we built a, 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 a virtual robotic hand with sensors on the fingertips and it would reach and grab these objects and try to identify them. So um, here's the kind of results we get. Um, this chart shows on the horizontal axis, which labeled target representation, those are the actual objects that were being sensed and the inferred representation of the, or the possible objects that were inferred or the system said, hey, I could be touching this. With one touch, with one um, uh, finger, if you will, one sensory patch, you have a lot of confusion. The perfect answer is just diagonal, but there's a lot of confusion. You really can't tell too much 
uh, from a single touch. The second touch, very move it very quickly, such as limiting down. There's a six touches, this is 10, and then you have a perfect answer. You, you get the result every time. And you can plot the results here uh, on this chart. The horizontal axis labeled number of column is the number of uh, century patches, like think of it, the number of fingers that are touching an object. And then the vertical axis is how many touches did you have to make? How many movements and touches did you have to make to, uh, to recognize the object? So, um, and, and so you can see very quickly uh, as the number of columns go up that you can, in, when you get here in this case, six columns or six fingers, if you will, a single touch is, is always sufficient. Um, and the different lines represent how difficult the object it is to recognize. Um, now, what are the, this is a, a, a biological theory. And so uh, it's grounded in neuroscience. And so we have, to, we have predictions about the neuroscience. I just wanna give an example of this and let you know that this is not made up. This stuff is really true. Um, and there's, there's growing uh, empirical evidence to support it. So here's the model we just talked about. And what we noticed um, in, when, we, when we started working with these models that these, these cell types, the ones we call the location and the sense feature are similar to cell types that are, exist in the old part of the brain. Um, they're called place cells and grid cells. Uh, neuroscientists all know about place cells and grid cells. If you're not a neuroscientist, you may not have heard of them, although you might have because uh, two Nobel prizes were given out for them. Um, place cells and grid cells are in an old part of the brain that uh, animals, including ourselves, use to learn environments. So this is usually studied with a rat, a rodent in, a, in some sort of environment. So I show a picture of that here. And as the rat moves around, the grid cells act like a reference frame and the place cells sort of act like where the rat is based on sensory input. So they're very analogous to what we're arguing with going on in the cortical column. And so we made the proposal. We said, look, the brain probably uses the same mechanism for this. It's a very complex mechanism. It's not easy to do this stuff in neurons. So um, the idea that when your finger is moving around the coffee cup, it's analogous to like the rat moving around in the box. It's basically, we figured that, that even though it's a different part of the brain, it's probably gonna be based on the same mechanism. So we made that proposal in a couple of papers. We made some predictions that we find certain cell types, these cell types similar to grid cells and plate cells in the cortex. That was a novel prediction. Uh, and now that's bearing fruit. Uh, I'm not gonna walk you through these experiments. They're very complex and they're very clever. Um, this is an experiment that was done with humans thinking about birds. And the birds have different uh, size uh, legs and different length necks. And the humans were in an fMRI machine and they were able to detect in a very clever way that in the prefrontal cortex, part of the cortex, that is when these people were thinking about birds, that there were grid cells there. And, they, and they actually the, the humans were thinking about birds along the reference frame of the grid cells. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but it's very clever experiments. And so they said, when we think about things, it's something like a bird, we're actually using grid cells in your neurocortex. Here's another study that came out in January. This is a study from a lab, uh, Long and Jiang, this is from China. Um, and they discovered um, grid cells, play cells, and these other cells, order cells in the somatocentric cortex like we predicted they would. Um, so there's a lot of growing evidence that this theory is, in, uh, is correct. And I'm not gonna walk you through these experiments. They're very complex. And if you're not a neuroscientist, you won't understand them. So now I'm gonna switch in my talk um, uh, to AI and machine intelligence. I've given you the overview of the thousand brains theory, but this is an AI conference. And so I should talk about that a bit. And this is our second mission, to take what we've learned about brains and apply it to AI. So what does the thousand brains theory tell us about machine intelligence? And here I'm talking about real machine intelligence. Uh, I don't think anything we're doing today is truly intelligent. Uh, today's artificial networks are very clever, they're very useful, they're powerful, but very few people think they're truly intelligent. They, they fall short in many, many ways. Um, so what do we know? We've learned the following things. First of all, we learned that intelligent machines need to learn a model of the world. Uh, and, and that inference, prediction, planning, and motive behavior are all based on this model. Now, machine learning researchers today might say, oh, I've trained the network to do uh, image classification. It's learned a model of the data. This is different. This is a model that literally captures the structure of the world. It, it, it learns three-dimensional models of objects and, and how they change and interact with each other and so on. So it's a different type of model. It's much more sophisticated than what most people think about. But this is, this is the crux uh, about what intelligence is about. Intelligence is about learning this model, not about solving a particular task. It's not about how do I solve this problem or solve that problem. It's how do we learn a model that can be applied to many different tasks. The second point is the model is distributed. And we talked about that's the thousand brains theory. It's distributed among many nearly identical units that reach a vote, the vote to reach a consensus. This architecture is extremely robust. 
uh, in the human brain, you can cut it, it the neocortex in half and it still works. You can have a stroke and you might lose all your vision, but you don't lose your hearing and your, and your sense of touch. And you can still operate in the world. You can still do language. Um, it's an extremely robust system. Uh, people can be blind or deaf or in blind and deaf and still build a very good model of the world. Another advantage of uh, using this, uh, this distributed model is that it can scale from very small to very large systems. Uh, a mouse's neocortex, its architect is same as, as ours. It's just got fewer columns. It's just a smaller version of it. But it's, I would say it's intelligent because it's using all the same principles. Um, but we can make them at many different sizes and, uh, and humans are not the end of it. We can make neocortex are much larger. It's, it also provides flexibility because you can work at any type of sensory array or any type of sensor or any size of sensory array. So humans, we have vision, touch, and hearing as our primary senses. Bats have a sonar. And the sonar works on the same principles in the neocortex. Um, and so there's no, there's no uh, restriction. It gives a tremendous flexibility in designing AI systems. What are the sensors we use and how large are they? Um, so you can have large versions and small versions. And, and then the voting system solves the binding problem. If you're not familiar with that term, is how do all these sensory inputs get integrated into a single perception? And the voting system explains that. It's, it's, it's been a vexing problem for many years. Uh, and now we have a very clean solution to it. So it allows you to do this sensor fusion. You can bring all these things together. And then, um, and then this is the most important part of the whole theory, the most important part of the, the whole idea about how to create machine intelligence. In each of these uh, modeling units in, in the cortex, these are the cortical columns, knowledge is stored in reference frames and it's learned via sensory motor interaction. This is the key to understanding everything. Um, it is how we, it's how we do unsupervised learning. We, don't, we can learn something without any supervision whatsoever. You can give me a new thing, I can look at it, I can touch it, I can figure out what it does. No one has to tell me anything about it. And, and, and the, the key to this is the fact that we learn through movement and knowing where our, our sensors are as we move. So we're not just being shown pictures of things, we're actually physically interacting with objects and figuring out where the different features are, even if it's just through vision. It also allows extremely fast learning uh, compared to today's uh, artificial neural networks where they have to be trained millions of repetitions we can learn something, a human can learn something very rapidly. And there's multiple aspects of this, but the reference frames enable it. It, it allows us to say, hey, I just, I just need to assign a new thing to some location. It's not, I don't have to affect anything else. I'm just affecting that location in, in the reference frame. And, and the final thing is that motor behavior is integrated into the system. Uh, you can't, you know, intelligence requires some sort of sensory motor integration. And in the future, robotics and AR are going to be the same thing. Um, they are in our brain, they're gonna be in the future too. You clearly can't separate them out. This does not mean every AI system has to have a body. It doesn't have to look like a robot. Um, you can have a virtual uh, system that moves a sensor. That sensor could be like a location in, you know, on the internet, or it could be uh, a, a conceptual location in a mathematical space. But there has to be the idea that there's a reference same location and movement, whether it's physical or not. And if it is physical, it doesn't have to look like a human. The physical embodiment can be very different than a human. So these are the principles. And uh, we have a very clear uh, idea of where we have to go to create truly intelligent machines. And the Menta, um, we decided to go about this by starting from today's artificial neural networks. And we created a roadmap to go to get to where we want to be. Um, we start with today's existing deep learning networks, convolutional networks, and so on. And we put a series of tasks. Now, some of these tasks I haven't talked about yet um, because they're more, very fundamental things. So sparsity is one of them. I'm gonna talk about that in, in more detail here. Yeah, in, in the brain, um, the neurons, most of the neurons are not active. Most of them, 98% of them are quiet at any point in time. So there's what we call sparse activations. That's different than today's artificial neural networks where all the units are active. And most of the connections of the brain are not connected. Most of the units are not connected. So in an artificial neural network, Almost every unit in one layer is connected to every unit in the next layer. In the brain, you don't see that at all. It's very sparse connections. Um, then there's these other things I'm going to talk about briefly, active dendrites, reference frames, and cortical columns. But we started, we are working on all of these right now, especially the first three. And we've been at it for about two years. Uh, we've been focusing, we've been the most progress on sparsity and, and then some other progress, pretty good progress on dendrites. So let me just talk about the sparsity for a moment. So the, the goal here is, is to take existing neural networks and make them sparse, sparse activations and sparse weights. Um, and, and by doing so, we, we can make them much more robust to noise and we can make them much faster. Um, and you can scale them much quicker. 
So we, we've done this with a bunch of networks. I'm just going to show you the results from this one, the speech, uh, Google speech commands data set. This is a data set of spoken words. Uh, it's a well-known uh, benchmark. Um, and these are one word utterances you might use when talking to Alexa or something like that. Uh, State-of-the-art accuracy on a convolutional neural network is 95% to 97%. And uh, people test it for robustness. So we've taken this data set and we, we sparsified it. Um, and so here uh, we can see some of the results. Um, uh, we're, we're comparing uh, a dense CNN, that's your, that's your classic uh, deep learning network that, that people use, and then the sparse version of it. The first thing they notice that we don't lose, we don't lose accuracy. This is surprising. You can turn off mo you know, most of the units and disconnect most of the connections and still maintain the uh, uh, competitive accuracy. So we don't lose any accuracy. We gain in noise robustness. So now if you add white noise to the system, uh, the sparse network is much more robust than the dense network. So that's a main thing. But here's where the real advantage comes in. The number of non-zero weights in these networks um, is, is less than a tenth. Uh, or it's, it's you know, only a tenth of the, of the connections uh, or weights are, 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 are established. So we have a, a greater than 90% sparsity. And this gives you some real advantages. This means that you're doing 90%, you know, one tenth the number of multiplies, one tenth the amount of memory movements and so on like that. And these systems can be very fast uh, in addition to being, um, uh, and small in addition to being more robust. Here we took um, uh, those networks and we ran them on some FPGAs. So these are from Xilinx. And so we're doing, again, the dense network and the sparse network on two different FPGA chips, the Yalvio, who's a high-end, very, very uh, fast, high-end chip. And then um, the ZU3 is a very low-end, very small chip. Um, and, um, and you can see right away that um, each network, uh, when we're running it on these FPGAs, is running about 33 times faster. So just running, the, you run the sparse network, you get the same accuracy, it runs 33 times faster. It's much smaller. So in the next column over, you can fit more of these networks on a chip. So instead of getting four on the chip, you can get 20 on a chip. And so the end result, you can actually get about 100, over 100 um, uh, a speed up in terms of throughput. You can run, you know, you can use 100th the power or run 100 times more networks. Uh, it's pretty dramatic. Um, we can even take these networks and put them on these small chips. Now, the speed up, it's kind of, if you say infinite, because you can't fit the dense network on these small chips. You know, but you can fit the sparse network on the small chips. And not only that, when you put the sparse network in the small chip, it runs much, much faster than the dense network on the faster chip. So it's, it's really powerful. And this is important for uh, things like edge, of, uh, uh, edge applications, if you're trying to embed these in cars or embed them in appliances. So now you can, you can do these networks in places you can't do before. So that's sparsity. Uh, we've been making great progress in that. We're currently doing uh, the similar type of uh, results on transformer networks. I, I'm not gonna present that material here. We haven't presented it yet. I want to next talk about um, active dendrites. Um, and um, all artificial neuron networks today use something called a point neuron, which is a very simple abstraction of a real neuron. In real neurons, um, they have what are called dendritic branches or uh, dendrites. And so all the connections are not in one place. They're spread out on these, on these dozens of dendrite branches. And there's some really important benefits from this. And we've written papers about this. But uh, we're now starting to replace the point neurons in artificial neural networks with neurons that have dendrite branches. And you can get some very important improvements. Um, it basically leads to a continuous learning and, and un, unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning. And the re one of the reasons you can get continuous learning is that when you learn new things, you don't update all the, all the synapses. You're only updating the synapses on one dendrite segment of some subset of the neuron. And so most of the learning you've performed before is unaffected by. So you can continuously learn without affecting previous things. And it also allows us to learn from prediction errors uh, and it requires less labeled data. So there's a whole bunch of real big advantages from using active dendrites. And that's the next thing uh, we're in the process of working on. We've just started working on the implementation of reference frames. And um, this is where the real power is gonna come in uh, now, all of a sudden, you'll have systems that are much smaller training sets, and they can understand compositional structure and, and really show very uh, flexible generalization. Uh, we've got a ways to go on that, um, but uh, we started that process. And ultimately, we want to do the entire cortical column, um, and uh, where you have this repeating element that we can apply over and over again. We can do this in software. We can do it in hardware. Uh, but now you have 
an integrated sensory motor system. It's highly scalable. It, it leads to advanced robotics. This, this roadmap here is, we don't know how long it's gonna take. We've been surprised how good, how good a progress we've made so far in the last couple of years. Um, uh, so I'm, pretty, I'm feeling pretty optimistic right now that at least we'll get through the reference frame stuff in the next three to five years. Uh, I don't know how long it'll take to do the full cortical column, but we, at least we have a roadmap. We know what we have to do. It's more engineering now and less science. Um, I'm very at the end of my talk here. Uh, this is my contact information if you want to send me an email. We have lots of papers on this stuff. You can find those papers at nementa.com slash papers. There's a bunch of people who worked on these things. It's, uh, it's not just me. So there's the name of some of the people who participated in this, uh, this research. And just to remind you again um, that, um, that there is a book available now in English about this if you want to read it. It's published by Basis Books, but Cheers Publishing will be doing the Chinese version in 2022 uh, for those of you who, uh, who prefer the Chinese version, which is probably most of you. So that's it. I'm done with my talk. I think we are, uh, I don't know how we did on time, uh, but we're supposed to have a few minutes here for, um, um, for Q&A, if we're going to do that. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jeff. So thank you for giving such an inspiring talk. So actually, there are some questions from online. There's a very interesting question. So one question is about uh, like uh, uh, sleeping, the, the sleeping state. So. The question is that uh, uh, when, uh, when a person, uh, when a human is uh, sleeping, so in this case, uh, so it seems like the brain is not, uh, the brain does not accept any new information. So what does brain do? And does uh, the brain working uh, work, work on like uh, com monitoring, compressing, or like yeah. they're, is they're learning something? Or is this kind of... Well, Super. What is what is what is sleep for? <laughs> I think right. That's the question. I think right. What what, yeah. what does sleep do? And uh, do we need it? Right. Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, sleep is a, essential for a biological brain. If you don't sleep, you'll not only get tired, you'll eventually die. So it's um, but it's not clear that you need sleep in a machine intelligence. Um, and so we have to bear that in mind. Uh, we do know several things that happen during sleep in a human brain. Uh, one, of them, one of the prevalent theories is that it, uh, there are accumulations of chemicals in the brain that have to be cleared out, and sleep clears them. Um, now, that's something that we won't have in a machine, an intelligent machine, that's not going to have those chemicals, it doesn't have those chemical processes. Another thing that happens during sleep is there is a type of consolidation of memory. And again, uh, the evidence we have now, and it's not final, but the evidence we have now is that is, is required because, again, because of biology. Uh, biology, when we want to learn something, we have to create new synapses and they have to, they have to be pertinent. We can do that very rapidly, by the way, but they take a while to get consolidated so they stay around, they don't, they, they'll disappear. There's different types of learning mechanisms that are going on in biology. And we don't have to emulate that. In our, in our simulations, we can form connections, any connections we want, um, from between energy neurons instantaneously because we're doing it in software. Um, in biology, you can't do that. In biology, you have to grow things to make connections and it's very complex how it has to happen. So I'm not a speech expert, I mean sleep expert, um, but uh, what I know about sleep is that it suggests that it's not an important consideration for intelligent machines, uh, although it's absolutely essential for humans and other animals. Uh, but it's a biological requirement, not an uh, intelligent requirement. That's, that's the, the information we have today suggests that's the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, another question is that it seems like there are different uh, uh, learning paradigms. So how does the brain make use of those different uh, learning paradigms? Hmm. I'm not sure what you mean by different learning patterns. Uh, I, could, I could guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really need more information on that. I, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what, I, you know, I, I, I think I'll just reiterate, we learn mostly um, through sensory motor interaction. That's how we learn. Now we can learn through language, but when we do that, we're sort of recreating these scenarios in our head. Um, but we learn mostly through sensory motor interaction. And, um, and, uh, and, on, and then on top of that, you know, there's short-term memory and there's long-term memory. There's all, there's all kinds of complications, there's, there's, you know, working memory, uh, but I, I can't answer the question further without more knowledge. 
Okay, thank you very much. So actually, there are uh, a lot of questions uh, online, but uh, due to time limitations, so we have to. Uh, maybe we can transfer these questions to uh, uh, send the question to you. Yeah, okay, maybe. I can I can do that. Many how many there are? So are, are we out of time then? Thank you very much again. All right. Well, thank you for having me again. I appreciate it very very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.